Hello, hello, hello. Hopefully uh, everything's online and working fine. Uh, if you've just joined, I've just joined. So welcome, my name is Damien and as promised, tonight I'm going to have a bit of a run through reading music notation. Now, um, you know, th there's a couple of reasons why I've done this, but um, originally uh, when I taught lessons and was, was teaching quite a lot, uh, I'd make sure that all my students could read because, um, you know, much like reading a book, you know, it's the language of musicians. And when we, if you've ever been in a jam room or you've been jamming with other musicians, you, particularly, you know, guitarists and people that play those sorts of instruments, you might hear them saying things like, oh, you know, this goes from D to G or to C. And, you know, and, and even sort of the, the, the musicians who are not that accomplished on those sorts of instruments, they still have a basic knowledge and, and communicate using the knowledge that they have. It's a bit different for drummers because drummers don't really care too much about things like chords and scales and, uh, you know, majors, minors, modes and all those sorts of things. But there is a language um, that we can and should be using and that language is uh, it's notation, it's, it's drum notation. Um, part of the problem with drum notation is that there hasn't really been a standard. There's been massive efforts to try and get the um, to get a standard in place so that everybody's writing things the same way. But as you know, you're, you're more than capable of learning drums without necessarily reading music. Um, so the first question that you might ask yourself is, well, why would I, why would I bother reading it? You know, if I'm uh, one of these people that can just pick things up off YouTube or by going and getting lessons, what value does reading music actually offer me? You know, and um, it's a couple of things. Again, it's, it's, the, it's the language of musicians for a start. Um, but it also gives you the ability to be able to translate what you're playing into something that's written. And of course, that helps a million ways because it means you don't forget it. Um, it means you can recall it whenever you need to. And it means if you're trying to show somebody else, uh, particularly if they're not local to you, what it is that you're playing and you don't have the capacity to actually record it or to film it, you can write it on a piece of paper. Uh, and in fact, that's exactly what uh, Sam Pettit and I did the other week. We were bouncing back ideas of a, of a drum feel that Sam was, was figuring out. Uh, and we just wrote it down on a scrap piece of paper and, and took a snapshot and sent it through to each other. Um, and, and the good thing about that, of course, is that even though we have all these fantastic tools available, when you're good enough at reading music, it actually becomes one of the most efficient ways of communicating. If I was to say to somebody, you know, we're going to play this for six measures and then on the count of three, we're going to stop with a cymbal choke. Um, you need to know what that means, right? That's just, I could explain that a hundred other ways, but it wouldn't be as efficient as what I just said. So there is value in learning it. And above all else, it's just, it's another tool and another skill that we could learn as drummers. So why wouldn't you take the opportunity to do it? So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go through um, it right back to the very, very beginning, okay? Because you don't want to miss the foundations. If you miss the foundations, then you're going to stumble across a piece of music down the track where you see something you don't know and you, you know, it's, it's not good. The foundation is very, very simple to learn, um, and and you know if you can count to four, and if you've ever played with other musicians, you've probably already done something like this anyway, right? So uh, here we go. So we're going to jump into it now. The first thing I want to point out is that um, there is a very, very good book uh, called Basic Drumming, and if you've just started to learn uh, drums, or even if you're quite a, a seasoned professional. This is, in my opinion, one of the best all-round books to help both your reading and your playing. It, it sort of dabbles a little bit in every area. There is a wealth of knowledge there, everything from playing jazz to learning rolls to playing rock beats to uh, learning syncopation. Um, so if you can, it's a book, a book by Joel Rothman. It's been out for you know decades now. Uh, very, very good book for um, you know just getting a good all-round uh, start on reading and playing. Um, I don't know what the book's worth these days, but um, it, it's quite a hefty book. Uh, and, you know, there's a wealth of material there. So in terms of being able to learn when you're not in a lesson or you're not able to jump onto YouTube, uh, you know, that's so much information in one book that if you can't read, you can't really get any value out of it. And it's a real shame, right? Because we know there are tons of books around just like this that can teach you a hell of a lot if only you knew how to read them. Okay. Now chances are you probably have some experience with reading musical notation anyway and maybe it's not in the form that you think it is and what I mean by that is if you've ever seen this sort of thing here or if you've ever seen this sort of thing here or this kind of thing here all right looking at tab this was very popular uh, about a decade ago when you weren't able to post um, music online so people 
made an attempt to try and recreate musical notes using um, using text. Okay, even playing Guitar Hero, Drum Hero, when you talk about certain things being hit at certain moments in time, uh, that's really the foundation of what written music is all about. So it doesn't have to be difficult. It's not a complex concept. You just have to understand what all the little elements mean uh, and then it becomes very, very intuitive. So if you've tried to learn music in the past and you're not having any luck with that at all or you sort of disbanded it because you, you, know, you weren't playing, you weren't reading nearly as well as you were playing, then I'd suggest to you just give it a chance. You know, do a little bit every day. Try writing down your ideas uh, and just always try to keep reading and learning a little bit more. And of course, we've got a wealth of information on this very forum. So if you uh, don't understand something that you're reading, throw a question forward and let people, uh, let people answer it for you. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to look at is this concept of measures. And up in the top left-hand corner, hopefully you all know who that is. It's a man by the, uh, man by the name of Dean Castronovo, phenomenal player. Um, was playing for Journey for quite some time, has done a whole lot of solo projects before that. Uh, absolute monster player. Cannot read music to save his life. Okay, so the reason I put that one there is just to show you you don't need to read music, but why wouldn't you take the opportunity to learn if it's being shown to you? Okay, so in musical notation, and this is straight from Wikipedia, a, a bar or a measure is a segment of time corresponding to a specific number of beats in which the beat, each beat is represented by a particular note value and the boundaries of the bar are indicated by vertical bar lines. All right. So if you look anything like this guy, I don't blame you, right? Now, technically, that is correct. That's what a bar is, but it's just a little bit too full on. So we're going to break it down a lot easier than that. Now, if you've ever played with Lego, and I'm sure most of us have, uh, you'll know that the pieces come in all different sizes and, uh, you know, some sizes are, you know, uh, are twice the size of some other sizes and there's all these different ways that you can put them together. And I chose Lego because primarily everybody understands Lego, right? And one of the points I want to make about writing music is while you may understand where notes fall in a bar, when it comes to drums, because drums are very short, sharp notes, a lot of the students that I've taught don't initially understand that these notes have a particular length or they take up a certain amount of time. Even though we only hear them instantaneously, you can only fit a certain number of these things in our music uh, and you need to know how much time each one of these things is taking up. So if we look at Lego, let's look at this example here. We've got um, these two different types of blocks. Okay, So we've got a grey base piece uh, and we've got these yellow blocks and we have these clear blocks. And the yellow blocks and the clear bo blocks are the same size. Uh, and you could fit four of them, any combination of four of them on that gray piece. All right, so that's pretty much all you need to know going into this. We've got these, we could fill up that gray piece with four blocks. And those pieces can either be yellow pieces or clear pieces. But you can only fit four of them on a gray, on a gray base. Okay, so hopefully you understand what I'm getting at there. And just to illustrate that a different way. So as a rule, we have to completely fill a grey base piece before we can start on another one. Okay? And we can fill each base piece, each grey base piece, with a combination of yellow or clear blocks. It's completely up to us. All right? And you can see a few examples of that on the screen there now. And this pattern of sort of filling this grey piece up with four blocks, this can continue indefinitely. But every time you fill the grey piece with four blocks, you have to take out another grey piece and then continue putting the blocks on it. And the important takeaway point here, as I said before, is that you're not just placing a block on the grey piece. Each block takes up a certain amount of room that you have available on that grey base. And once you've filled that base, you're done. You have to either grab another base piece or start pulling some of your yellow and, and clear blocks off. Okay, Keep that in mind when we move on because uh, it's very, very relevant once we start introducing, you know, notes and musical notation. Okay. When we write words, we so so think now just about general language, written language. So you're reading a book, right? When we write words, we use full stops to break things into sentences. Right? And that and what that does is it makes reading easier and, and a little bit more logical, right? If you've ever tried to read somebody who doesn't use, you know, grammatical um, uh, notation if they don't use commas they don't use full stops it's really difficult to read so that the full stops or the periods they actually just break the words up into smaller pieces to make things easier to read okay and we actually do the same thing in music so when we write music we use what they call bar lines 
right? Which break all of our music up into smaller pieces, like we saw with sentences, but we call our sentences in music measures, right? They are certain periods of time where once we've gone a certain amount of time, we close, you close it off with a bar line, the same as we would with a full stop, and we start a new measure, okay? Um, again, it's done for the same reason. It makes reading of music easier and more logical. And what measures do, measures break up the space that we write our music on. And much like we saw just with the Lego example, once a measure is full, we have to close it off using a bar line and start another measure. And we can write as many measures as we like as long as we're closing them all off once they're full. Okay? So now let's have a look at an example of music. So the vertical lines which break the music into smaller sections, as we just found out, are called bar lines. Okay, and I've, I've highlighted a few of them there. So you can see in between all of this music, we see this vertical line that cuts the five horizontal lines, and each of those lines is called a bar line. Okay, the space between each of those bar lines is known as a measure. Okay, this is also called a bar, all right? Obviously, because we have a bar line, the line breaks up the bars. So it doesn't really matter whether you use a bar or a measure. Most people in the industry would know what you're talking about. Um, so, you know, that's good. So straight away, we've, we've started to chop our music down into bite-sized pieces. We don't know a lot about what's actually happening in terms of the notes there yet. But again, we take it slowly, we get the foundation right, uh, and then we won't get confused as we go forward. Now, of course, I'll be saving this and hosting this on the, um, on the PD page, so you can always go back and have a look and, and re-listen, okay? So now we're going to look at our first type of note, and it's what we call a quarter note. Okay, the guy you see on the left-hand side there, you sh again, should probably know who this guy is, a guy by the name of Simon Phillips, another phenomenal drummer. Um, and the little speech bubble there is one, two, three, four. We've probably all done this when we start songs. Um, but there's actually a bit of a, a, um, there's a there's theory behind it. There re there's a reason why we count four and not six or two or A, B, C. Um, and we're going to get into that right now. So we've already seen that the measures or the bars that we just spoke about, they divide our music into smaller sections to make music easier to read. Okay. Now, each measure needs to be completely filled before we start a new one. So again, just think back to the Lego example if, you, if you're having trouble following. We have to completely fill the space before we can start another, uh, another you know, uh, grey bass piece. Okay. Now, the two bricks that we were using in Lego, we could either use a combination of the yellow or the clear ones to fill out that grey bass piece. Or in other words, we can use a combination of notes to fill up a measure until that measure is full. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at the very first type of note that we learn, okay? And it's called a quarter note. Now, quarter notes are, in a formal sense, they're actually known as crotchets, okay? Um, we don't refer to them that much nowadays, uh, but that does very much depend on the instrument you're playing. With drums, most of us know them as quarter notes. Um, and if you look at the note itself, I'll just bring my cursor over here. Hopefully you can see that. We have, th there's, there's essentially two components to a note. So we have the note head, and this is the round, solid, black um, dot, I guess, or spot that you can see there. That's called the note head. And where the note head sits tells you a little bit about what's being played. In fact, it tells you a lot about what's being played. But coming off the note head, we have what we call a stem. Now, depending on where the note head sits in our music, that stem could either go pointing up and join to the right-hand side of the note, or it could be pointing down and to the left-hand side of the note. But a quarter note will always have the appearance of a note head and a, and a perpendicular stem, either up or down or on either side of the note. So when you see a note that looks like either of these two, it is definitively a quarter note and it will not be anything else. Okay? So that is a note that we can use to indicate that we are playing a certain part of our kit at any point in time. But there's also another type of quarter note, and that's a rest. Okay, now when we count music, we count one, two, three, four. But as you would already know, when we count, we're not always playing. Sometimes we're just counting and not playing anything at all. The count continues, um, you know, whether we play or not. We have to just keep that count consistent. But we have choices as to whether we can play something on that particular count or not play something on that particular, particular count. So, for example, if we were looking at... Um, you know, counting four and we were saying, you know, one, two, three, four, then we're playing.
playing on every note that we count. So we would use that quarter note with the note head and the stem to indicate that we are hitting in each of those spots on the one, two, three, four. However, if I was playing something like this, one, two, three, four, then I'm only hitting on one and four, but on two and three, even though I'm counting those notes, I'm not playing anything there. And this is why we need to use rests, okay? Because rests indicate that you count that note, but you don't play anything there. You just leave it out, okay? So we can use a combination. It, as you can see here, it's like the yellow bricks and the clear bricks. In our measure or in our bar, we have a certain amount of room, and we can either fill that with quarter notes or quarter note rests depending on what notes we're playing and what we're not playing. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Moving on to the next step. Click this forward, here we go. Okay, so as we know with our Lego example, each base piece has enough for four blocks. And if we were to relate that back to the quarter note idea, we can say that each measure, so not each gray piece now, but thinking in terms of music, each measure has enough space for four quarter notes. So each quarter note is one of those yellow bricks if you want to think of it that way, right? Why do I keep going back to this brick example? Because I want people to realize, and this is where people get lost, that that quarter note, right? When we count them one, two, three, four, we're not just hitting on one. That quarter note takes up all the room from one when we first hit it all the way to two which means if you were trying to play something between one and two, you can do it, but that wouldn't be a quarter note anymore. So it's effectively like saying, I'm going to play something on one, but because it's a quarter note, then like the yellow brick, it's going to take up all that room, and the very next spot that I'm going to be av have available to play anything is going to be on the count of two. So that bottom line that you see with the quarter notes on there, that would be played one, two, three, four you'd start again one two three four okay so you're playing every note in the bar and those quarter notes would fall on the one the two the three and the four and the reason they're called quarter notes is because it's talking about the amount of room that that note is taking up technically what it's saying is each one of those notes is taking up one quarter of all of the room in that measure if you have a measure or a bar and you play a note that lasts for one quarter of that bar, then you're playing a quarter note. Okay, hopefully that's making sense. Feel free, obviously, to ask your questions as, as you hear me talking. I can, I can see your uh, comments, uh, so I can answer as I go. All right, so as before, as I said, we can fill out this, this measure with notes or rests, uh, and we can write quarter notes actually with the stems facing up or down, as I said before, uh, depending on what is going to be easiest to read. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on. The, um, as, I, as I also pointed out, the upward facing stems, like you see on the count of one in this example, the upward facing stems always will attach to the right hand side of the note head. And in fact, any type of note that we learn from this point forward, because there's many more other than just quarter notes, but if you are placing the stems upwards, then they must join to the right hand side of the note of the note head. Okay? And similarly, as you can see on the counts of three and four there, if you choose to put the stems down, and remember it is a choice, uh, if you choice choose to put the stems down, then they must attach to the left hand side of the note head. That's correct musical notation, okay? All right, so we've talked enough about the, the, the Lego blocks example, so we're going to start using the, uh, the jargon itself. We're going to start using musical jargon a little bit more now. So once a measure is full of notes or rests, because remember, you can either play or choose to not play. So once our measure is full of quarter notes or quarter note rests, we must insert one of those bar lines and begin a new measure or a bar. Right? So just think of it. You, you, you're counting one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. No matter what you choose to do on those counts of one, two, three, four, once you get to four and you place that last note in the measure, whether it's a note or a rest, you then have to close it off and start a new measure and you keep going. Right? This is why we count one, two, three, four, and then that's, that counting keeps cycling. What we are doing is we are counting off measures. You may have heard bands talk, oh, you know, let's take it from bar 64. Now you know what bar 64 is. Somebody's counted up to four, 64 times. And the 64th time that they put that bar line in and open that new bar, that's bar number 64. 
Uh, and in fact, when you see music written out, particularly when it's you know lengthy, so we're talking about um, transcribing songs and things like that, often what they'll do is they will number the measures or put, put numbers above the bars so that you know where you are in the music. Okay, So you don't have to count from the beginning. It's uh, obviously laid out for you most of the time. And again, like we saw with the Lego, you can continue this thing indefinitely, bar 64 and, and well beyond. Okay, so there you go. So we can see uh, in that second example there down the bottom, we have a note on one, we have a rest on two, then a note on three, and then a note on four. So if I was counting one, two, three, four, and I was to play that bottom line, this is how it would sound. Okay, and you could probably figure it out already, but I'm going to count as well. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, next bar, one, two, three, four, next bar, one, two, three, four. Okay, they're all quarter notes. Some are quarter, note, quarter notes that you play, some are quarter note rests, but you're just counting to four, you're either hitting or not hitting uh, on each of those counts, and then once you get to four, the measure is full, you close it, you start a new one. Okay, hopefully that all makes sense so far. All right, so you should now know enough, even at this very early stage, to be able to play the piece of music that you can now see in front of you. Um, now, we're only looking at uh, one horizontal line, and if you're thinking, where's all those other lines that I normally see with music? We're getting to that. Uh, but one shorthand way of writing music is if you're only ever playing on one instrument, uh, let's say, for example, that this example is only being played on the snare drum, uh, something that drummers do a lot is they actually knock out the other lines, to, again, to make it easier to read. We're always we're always trying to make things as easy as possible to read. So you should know enough by now to play this piece on the snare. Um, you would put your metronome on and you could put it on at any speed that you feel comfortable. Um, but bear in mind, you have to read a little bit ahead of where you are so that you don't sort of hit a brick wall. Um, and remember, you've got to count every note. So whether it's a quarter note being played or a quarter note resting. So the first two lines would be one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Two, three, four. All right, so that was the first two lines. Pretty simple, right? Now, note that I didn't get confused. Some of those notes had the stems facing up. Some of those notes had the stems facing down. It doesn't matter. They all look like quarter notes, so they're all being counted and played like quarter notes, okay? So don't be misled whether the stem is up or down. It makes little difference, okay? In fact, it makes no difference. All right, now we're going to look at the staff, okay? I wonder if anybody knows, maybe put in the comments if you know who this gentleman is on the left-hand side. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. Uh, but uh, yeah, put your comment forward and let me, let me know if you think you know who this is. Okay, uh, now before I get into this, I also want to highlight one other book. And this is a book that I've been working from since probably about two or 2003, four maybe, I'm not too sure. Um, as I said earlier in the piece, we, we uh, are trying to standardize the way that we write drum notation because it was a bit of a free-for-all up until the last couple of decades. Um, now, this particular book by Norman Weinberg is the Guide to Standardized Drum Set Notation. I now use the notation that he uses, uh, and I think the more people that do this, the better because then we're getting towards that standard. Uh, if you do have the book, fantastic. If you don't have the book, um, just bear in mind that this is this is where I place the notes. This is my, my theory behind it. It's always in, in, uh, uh, in, in sort of in sync with, with what uh, Norman has outlined in the book. Sorry, Chris, it is not Dennis Chambers. Okay, and the reason I use this book is because it's uh, the Percussive Arts Society, which is kind of like the, I guess, not the board of directors, but kind of like the head board for percussion around the word. This is actually an approved book by them. So um, PASS also has... Um, input in that the, the 26 or the 30 or the 40 standard drum rudiments. So um, when we standardized those rudiments, the Percussive Art Society had a big say in that as well. So PASS is kind of like the body that looks at it and goes, you know, I bestow this to be official upon you. Um, it also, this book covers literally every parts of the kit from big to small, uh, including the cowbell. So it, it's all in there. Uh, and it is actually quite a modern book as well, 98. So, you know, it's, yeah, okay, it's 22 years, but. Uh, that's still actually quite modern when you look at the age of some of the books like Stick Control and that that we've been working for. Okay, now, the staff itself. Now, just as lines exist on note paper to give us something to write our words on, the staff is a series of these five lines which we use for writing our music on. Okay, now, 
the lines themselves and the space between them are usually given specific note pitches depending on what we call the clef. Okay, now you can see on the left hand side there, you've probably seen this image before. On the left hand side, we see this curly thing here. Uh, and depending on the symbol you see there, it actually isn't always uh, the one that you see there that we're most familiar with. That's actually a treble clef. Um, the clef will tell you a lot of information about the kind of instrument you're playing or the kind of music being played. Okay, so uh, for treble clef at least, um, one of the most, uh, I mean, it's the most common type of, of, of clef that we see. Uh, the lines and the spaces, those five lines, are given certain pitches. And that's what you can see in the middle there. So if you remember when you went to school, if you did any, any sort of music theory, they would always say, every good boy deserves fruit. And that was always the lines. And in between the lines, you'd have F, A, C, and E. Uh, and they sort of drill that into you, right? And, and that's all well and really good. But what happens is when we were playing recorder or whatever it was at the time, we knew that as we played higher pitches on the instrument, it, those notes would actually move up those lines and even go well above those lines for some instruments. But that doesn't make a lot of sense with drums because we don't, we don't hold notes. We can't play an E flat, for example, right? So um, what we do is we have to look at a different way of writing this music when it relates to drummers, right? The treble clef and the notes and the sharps and flats don't make a lot of sense when we talk about drums. Now, the good thing is when we're talking about quarter notes and putting the musical notes in, they're actually consistent on any instrument. Right, but the clef is different, and what we use the note, the 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 staff lines and the spaces for is also different to what you would have on different instruments. Okay, so we don't actually use pitch; um, we use the lines and the spaces on the staff to to denote certain parts of our drum kit. Well done, Ash. It is actually John Blackwell. Now the thing about drums is. Um, you know, and as I said, we know that some parts of the kit are higher pitched than others, but drums don't necessarily have any one specific pitch. So we have to make this new type of clef, right? Uh, and there's actually two that we can use. Uh, there's one you can see on the right, on the left hand side there, the two vertical lines, uh, and that's the percussive clef. And this is the one we g generally use when we're writing drum music. And you'll always see it at the beginning of any uh, any line. Uh, when you're looking at all your measures. So anytime you start a new line, and certainly at the beginning of the piece of music, you will see the clef written out. So straight away, it will tell you what instrument this piece of music that you're about to play is intended for. So if you see those two vertical lines, you know straight away it's for percussion. Now, less commonly, but still acceptable, you could use what they call the neutral clef. Um, I don't use that personally too much, but it's actually perfectly acceptable. So if you see either of these two symbols at the beginning of a piece of music and at the beginning of each line of music, uh, very good chance that it's probably going to have something to do with percussion, if not drums themselves, okay? Uh, so that's what you're going to be on the lookout. Now, if I go on to the next slide here, this is what it looks like when you see it across the range of a, you know, a, 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 like a sheet of music. I haven't put any notes on here yet, just to keep it nice and clean. So that's what you'd see, these two vertical lines. And when you see that, uh, you'll know that it's for, it's for drums. Now, it, I've actually written out drum set there. That's very nice if they do that, but don't expect that it's always going to be made that obvious for you. All right? So if you see a piece of music that has the treble clef, that's eh, not for drums. Okay? Now, there are examples where certain pieces of music will actually contain a lot of instruments all within the one piece of music, and they'll sort of join all these lines together. I don't want to get into that yet. It's, it's definitely technically correct, uh, but it's just a little bit above where we want to be right now. We're trying to keep this, as I said, very, very simple. And once again, feel free to ask your questions as I'm going through, if you do have any. I can see your, your comments. All right. Now, here's a sheet of music. We've now put some notes on here. Now, we already know that the stems on notes can face either up or down, but to be more correct, if the note head itself, so let's look at this very first note here. If the note head itself sits above the middle staff line, remember the staff is those five horizontal lines that we see. So this middle one here, if the note head sits above that middle line, then generally we will face the stems down, okay? So that's actually correct for the first note. The second and third note on the counts of two and three there, it's not technically correct. There's nothing wrong with doing it, but it's not, the, it's not technically the correct way to write it. Okay, so anything above that middle staff line, you'll point the stems down and you'll join them to the left-hand side of the note. 
Anything that sits below that middle staff line, obviously, you're going to face the stems upwards. So um, in this case, if you're very keen, you've probably realized um, that all of these note heads are all in the same spot. They all sit between the sort of the, the second and third line from the top, right? So they're all in the same spot. They've got some stems pointing up and some pointing down, but all of these notes are actually all in the same spot, right? Now, if you are a, a reader of drum music already, you would actually know that that is the spot that we use for the snare drum. So this entire piece of music would be played on the snare drum. And I don't doubt that if you followed along so far, you could probably put your metronome on and play this piece of music knowing that we have nothing but quarter notes here. Yes, some of the quarter notes are indeed rests, like uh, we can see in the second measure here, which I'm circling now. In that second measure, we have a rest on the count of two. See, we're starting to sound like musicians now, right? It's starting to sound like we know what we're talking about. So in the last measure, we have a snare drum on the counts of one and three, and we have a rest on the count of two and four. And I encourage you to use this jargon as much as you can because it will reinforce that usage and obviously help you remember what these things are all about. Now, there's actually also some extra stuff at the beginning that we haven't covered yet that you've probably also seen before, namely this, this stuff that's going on here with the numbers four and the, and the little 120 marking there. So let's have a little bit of a zoom in on that and just discuss this part of it. Now, most of the time, you will only see these little fours or these numbers stuck in the, in the staff. You'll only see them at the beginning of a piece of music or where there is a significant change, and we'll get onto that later. But generally, at the beginning of a piece of music, we will see some sort of symbol in this spot. We've got two fours there. And we'll normally see some sort of quarter note with a number next to it sitting above that. Okay. Now, the two number fours that we see make up what's known as the time signature. I'm sure you've all heard that phrase being used before. And the time signature gives us information about how we're going to count the music that's coming ahead. Okay, I'm going to get more on that later. We're not going to get into time signatures now. But whatever the time signature is, that's how and where you see it in a piece of music. Normally right at the beginning and whenever the time signature changes, if it changes at all. And it doesn't always in a song. Sometimes it stays exactly the way it is. Now the little quarter note... We've learned that this is a quarter note. The little quarter note sitting above the staff with the, with the 120 next to it is a tempo marking. And that gives us information about the speed at which we are going to count the music that's coming up. Okay, so the time signature tells us how we count it. The tempo marking tells us how fast we're going to be counting it. Okay, more on tempo later. Now, the four quarter notes that we see in the first measure, as I said before, they're all snare drums. Okay, and just bringing that uh, example back on the screen. If we look at that example once more, we can see that the notes are all being played on the snare drum. And this time I've actually marked that out. So where you can see the yellow strip, you can see that we've got all quarter notes there. And they're all in that, that position between the second and third notes from the top. Okay, so when you're reading a piece of music, don't pay too much attention at this point to whether the stems are up or down. But you must pay attention to where those note heads are sitting. If they're sitting in the spot that we just outlined, they're always going to be snare drums. All right, so you need to reinforce that into your head. Okay, but they're not the only kind of instrument that we play on drums, and we know that. Okay, so let's look at some common types. We know that the snare drum sits between the second and third line from the top when we're looking at percussive clef. The bass drum, or the kick drum, sits between the, the last and the second last line on our staff. And then if we're looking at a five-piece kit, so we've got two toms on the rack and we've got one floor tom, this is where those toms would be laid out. So we'd have tom one sitting between the top two lines. Tom two is actually going through a line. And then the floor tom sits on the second and third line up from the bottom. Now, there's no way for me to sort of show you a trick to remember this. You just have to know that that's where they are, okay? Now, the reason all of these notes are written with the same kind of note head is because they're all drums, all right? And this is the other thing that's a little bit different with drum notation. We don't always use this black spot or this black dot or this black note head, right? Most of the time when you're reading other music from uh, melodic instruments, let's say it was guitar or even flute or whatever it may be, this is kind of the only kind of note that you see when you're talking about quarter notes. Um, but in drums, we have 
you know, many different parts of the kit, and we actually choose to write some of them using a different type of note head. Now, if it's a drum that you're playing, as in it's a snare, or it's a, a tom, or a bass drum, or it's some sort of round wooden thing with a drum skin on it, usually you're going to be using the solid black circle that you can see in front of you now. But what about cymbals? Okay, now when we look at cymbals, the three common types we look at are hi-hats, ride, and crash, which is what most people have on their drum sets. Now, hi-hats are a cross. In fact, any cymbal, we try to write it using X's or crosses, okay? So straight away, when you see drum music, if it's written using this standard that we're all trying to get towards, and you see an X in or around the staff, chances are it's going to be a symbol of some type. Now, we have splashes, and we have chinas, and stacks, and we have bells, and all sorts of things that qualify as symbols. Um, and when you get to that stage where you have like seven or eight or nine or 12 different kinds of symbols, you can kind of play around with where these things are. Um, are, are positioned on the staff but what you normally do is you put what they call a legend at the beginning of the music and you write out to tell people where everything is going to be and this is kind of what you're seeing now so at the beginning of a piece of music I might say right up in the top right hand corner of the piece of music anytime you see a little x that sits on the top line that's where the hi-hat's going to be and anytime you see that x going through the top line that's where the ride symbol is going to be. And any time you see a crash symbol, now let's have a quick look at the crash symbol because that's actually sitting above the staff line. Now, when we move above or below the staff, which we're welcome to do, the lines are actually still there, but we don't draw them unless we need them. Okay, so what's happened with the crash symbol here is that we start with the ride symbol, which goes through the top line. Then we have the hi-hat, which sits between the line. And then the crash symbol goes up one position again. And it actually goes through, I guess you could call it an imaginary line that's not written. But you can see that that X has a dash through it. And what that dash is doing is it's representing the next line up from the staff if it was going to be drawn in. Now, of course, we don't want to draw 300 lines for every piece of, of you know, pit, uh, bit that we have on our kit. So we still only draw the five staff lines. But if we happen to go above or below that staff, we just use a little piece of that line to show how far above or below that staff that you are. Okay, hopefully that makes sense to you. Now let's have a look at this graphically. Now you need to memorize these. As I said before, this, there's no easy trick for this. But the parts of the five-piece kit would look like this if you saw them positioned within the staff. So once again, just to recap, all of the symbols are typically written as X's. Uh, anything that is a drum is typically written as a solid note. It's not a hard and fast rule, but for where we're at with our reading right now, it's as, it's as good as a definition, okay? So again, pause it at this point or go back and have a look at this point uh, and, and drill that into your minds because it, you're going to see it quite a lot, okay? Now, what happens in a situation, let's say we're playing a rock beat, and most of us know that when we first play a rock beat, the very first note that we play is actually two notes together. It's a hi-hat hit in time with a bass drum. Now, because we read notes in music the same way we would read words on a page, we tend to read them from left to right. Um, when we're playing two notes together, then what happens is we write those notes directly on top of each other. And if they're the same kind of note, if they're all quarter notes that we're playing, then you would join them all with one single stem. So you can see, uh, it's probably easier to see on the right-hand side here, but you have this situation where we have three notes being played together, right, just on the count of one here. So just this very first note that I'm circling now. So we have a first tom, so that's tom one, and then down here we have the floor tom, and we have the bass drum. So we have the, the first tom, the floor tom, and the bass drum all being played together. You can probably visualize what this is going to look like but it's all being played together on the count of one. So if we're counting one, two, three, four, on the count of one, the three of those things hit together. And if you read the rest of that bar, what it says is that two, three, and four are exactly the same way. So we're playing this beat that's got the first tom, the floor tom, and the bass drum all being played on the quarter note. One, two, three, four. So it's like some crazy tom beat. Okay, so... That's kind of cool. So we know that if we're looking at quarter notes and you see two note heads or, or a bunch of notes joined together with a single stem, it means that you're playing them together. 
All right, which we know happens quite a lot when we're when we're playing drums. Okay. So now let's look at a, a bit of a crazy example. You're probably thinking at this point, oh, but you know this is really really simple stuff, and I, I I'm kind of feeling like there's so much information here, and, I, and and now I look at a piece of music like this, and I'm just confused. I I can't I don't know anything about this, and that's actually not true. So while we can't really read a lot right now. Having a solid foundation in the basics of reading really allows us to recognize many things. Even about this piece here, sure, we can't read it, but there are some things that we already know and have learned just with the tutorial that we've been looking at today. And here's a few of them, okay? We know the clef. We know this is percussion clef. We know that it's going to be uh, a tempo of 81, right? We can see here that uh, we know this is a hi-hat because it's sitting as a cross on the top line, right? We know that's a hi-hat. There's a bar line. Okay, we know that any space between two bar lines is going to be a measure or a bar. Um, and so when we count this, even though we can't play the notes, there's still a lot that we do know. All right. And this is kind of how music works. You learn a little bit and then you see a little bit and you go, oh, OK, I, I, I get that and I get that. But I don't understand this and I don't understand this and I don't understand this. And by learning a little piece and a little piece, it's kind of like learning a language. Right. Eventually, well, initially, you just learn a couple of words. But then later on, you start learning a couple of words and sentences start to make sense. And you can kind of figure out what they're talking about. Music is exactly the same way. So, you uh, you know, even now I've been reading music for, you know, nearly 40 years and there's still things I see occasionally. I say, well, gee, what's that? But it doesn't mean that I'm completely stumped. You can kind of figure out what's going on. So when you learn these basics, you learn this foundation you find that you actually pick things up and it starts to all come together and it starts to make more sense. Um, of course, it's very much like a language in that regard in that it's living. And what I mean by that is if you're not using it, if you're not writing things down, if you're not learning from a book or trying to use and better your theory knowledge and your notation knowledge, you will forget it and you won't use it. Okay, so when you stop using this stuff, it dies. Right? It, it only exists because you are making it part of what you do as part of your practice schedule. Uh, and, and again, once you've learnt this stuff and you've learnt it well enough, um, then it starts to stick. But you've got to practice in those early days. It's not difficult, but your reading is not going to be at a point right now that your playing is at. And that's one of the real big, big challenges I find when a, when a student comes to me and they are you know, reasonably good as a player um, and I take them back because they haven't learnt to read music, what they find initially is that what they can read is really, really basic stuff. It's well below what they can actually play. And because they want to be better as players, they seem to think that there's going to be this huge catch up with their reading before it's going to be any good. It's actually not the case, right? So even if you play quite well now and you can't read, that doesn't mean that the reading is useless to you. It actually has value. You just have to keep chipping away at it, you know, daily if, if possible. Okay, now that's where I was planning to end it because what happens now is we, we would go on to the next type of note and we, and we start taking it up a step. But as I outlined in the beginning of the presentation, I don't want to make this complicated, okay? So as a quick recap, we learned about measures. We know that measures are the space that we can use to, to write our music out. And we've learned about a staff, okay? And a staff is those horizontal five lines that will help us determine which instrument we're going to play depending on where they sit, either on those lines, between those lines, or even above and below those lines, okay? But then we also talked a little bit about the kinds of notes that we can use. So we've talked about a quarter note. And so we have these four spots in a bar on the count of one, two, three, and four, where we can either choose to play a note anywhere on that staff, be it a tom or a hi-hat or a snare drum or a kick drum, and we can play a note or we can leave a note out, that's called a rest, on any of those counts of one, two, three, and four. But once we've made a decision for each of those counts of one, two, three, four, then we have to close the measure and we have to begin a new measure where once again we start filling it with notes or we start filling it with rests. Okay? Um, now, again, Think of your Lego scenario because, as you know, if you were going to, and in fact, I'll just bring this, this example back up again. Uh, where is it here? Here we go. So if I look very quickly back at this example, 
you can see that in the first measure, or the first bar, I have four snare drums, and those snare drums are being played on the count of one, two, three, and four. Now, as you know, if I'm counting one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, if I decide to play something between those counts, which of course we can do, one, two, three, four. So if I'm hitting between those counts, right, then the count of three and four cannot be a quarter note. Why? Well, think back to your Lego example. If I've put a block in three and I decide to not, uh, sorry, I decide to put something in between the count of three and four, I can't do it because I've got a block sitting there. And it's not just the hit, the snare hit on three that we're considering. Remember that like a Lego block, that hit on three is actually taking up all of the room until four. There's no space there. It's full, right? Again, it's a very common problem or a very common challenge that particularly drummers face when they learn to read because our notes don't sustain. It's not like holding a note with the exception of maybe like some cymbal swells or something like that. But generally when we play notes, we hit them and they're gone. And so we think that when we're writing music on a page, we're only considering the actual point at where we hit the note. And that's not true when we write quarter notes. Quarter notes take up space. Okay, so even though we would only hear the hits on one, two, three, and four, that bar is now completely full of notes. And so if I want to have another note in between three and four, well, I need to make space for it. So what I need to do is I need to take out my Lego block that's hitting, that's sitting on three and four, and I, I actually need to use a different size block. I need to use a smaller block on three so that I can open up some space between three and four to put in another block. Does that make sense? So by putting blocks on one, two, three, and four, my quarter notes are now filling that measure completely. If I want to put more notes and more music in that first measure, I need to make space for it, which means those blocks that I'm using can't be as big as they are anymore. I've got to start using smaller blocks if I want to start putting more notes in there. So hopefully that makes sense. What I'm going to do at this point is I'm just going to sit in my camera. If anybody's got any questions, and I might even throw some... Uh, some questions forward to each of you, maybe a little bit of a quiz and see who answers what. In fact, I might do that. How many quarter notes, here's my first question, first in with the buzzer gets it. How many quarter notes could you place in five measures of music? Now these quarter notes can be rests or they could be notes. But how many quarter notes could I fit in five measures of music and have a glass of wine. See them all madly, madly scraping for the for the keyboard. Sam's not allowed to answer this by the way. How many quarter notes could I have in five measures? Patty, you are the winner, 20, exactly. So four per measure and five measures. Now again, those notes could be rests or they could be notes that you actually play. They could be played on any part of your drum kit, but at most you could have 20 of them, okay? If you need 21 notes, well, guess what? You're now starting a sixth measure. All right, now again, I know that most people have probably learnt music you know, enough to, to understand what they've seen tonight. But hopefully what I've done is I've put down a bit of a foundation uh, and covered enough of the basics so that there's no, there's no gaps in your learning at this point. And what I'm planning to do is to move on to uh, another lesson maybe next week or within the next couple of days, which will take the knowledge that we've learned from tonight and actually build on it. And we'll start looking at different kinds of notes uh, and, and the ways that they can be written differently in combination with, with quarter notes that we've seen tonight. Okay, so from here, it does sort of escalate in terms of how complex this could be. Um, but certainly, you want to be very comfortable with what you've seen and heard tonight. Uh, if you are, fantastic. If you're not comfortable with what you've seen or you've got more questions, uh, either ask them in the chat now. I'll just hang around for about 30 seconds or so. Uh, otherwise, just find me offline, shoot me a message, and uh, once again, look into those books, Basic Drumming by Joel Rothman, uh, and also the Guide to Standardized Music Notation, which is an excellent resource for those people learning to read music uh, and, and learn it in a way that 
uh, that I'll be showing it, um, and, and it obviously keeps it consistent. Um, you know, you could open books right now, music books that you probably hadn't um, you know, been able to learn from, and you'll probably see things in there right now that start making more sense just because you've taken you know, half an hour or so to... Um, you know, to really learn the basics of, you know, what a staff is and what a time, uh, what a quarter note is and what a rest is. And, you know, now hopefully you know why some stems go up and down and why all of the notes on the page that you see in front of you are all the same kind of note, whether they're up or down, right? All of these little things that you kind of take for granted, if you don't learn them, um, music looks a hell of a lot harder than it should be, okay? And this is also a throw, a throw out to teachers who teach this because, um it's not easy stuff to teach from a teaching perspective because kids learn things very, very differently. Um, but it takes time to teach this stuff. And, and obviously, as a student, it takes time to, to develop this. Um, but it should be simple enough at this point that most of you can follow along. Okay, well, I'm not seeing any questions coming through. So what I'll do is I'll leave the tutorial there. If you do have any questions, again, feel free to contact me offline. Um, next week, what we'll do is we'll look at the next type of note, which is called an eighth note. You can probably already figure out what it's all about. Um, but we also need to think about not only how they look different, but also how they sound different and how they work with quarter notes. So we're going to dive a little bit deeper into the theory. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're just going to keep introducing new kinds of notes and new ways to see them and work with them. And we're going to start building up this library of ways that you can write out what it is that you play. Uh, and that's the last point that I'll leave you with. When you play your stuff now, if you have beats that you play, it may not be correct. You may not have the knowledge to write out very accurately what you're doing, but have a go. Try placing the, the, the music that you play, the, the, the beats that you, tr you play, try writing them out in the measure and see if you can actually translate what it is that you're playing onto a sheet of paper. That's how we get better of this st at this stuff, okay? Okay, so I'll leave you there. Uh, have a great night. And um, yeah, hit me up if you need anything in future. See you later.